Up here in the Northern Hemisphere, spring's well underway and we're all looking forward to the warmth and sunshine of the summer months. But for many people working in the climate science world, it also represents another anxious time watching the annual decline in extent and thickness of the Arctic sea ice with the worry that this year might once again break the record for the lowest extent or even become the year when finally an ice-free Arctic is declared in September for the first time in the history of our civilization. Losing that ice carries many potentially catastrophic consequences for our planet's ecosystem, as we've looked at more than once on this channel. But if you're possessed of a certain type of mindset and you're driven by the same basic instincts that motivate a small baby to grasp at whatever's in front of it with absolutely no consideration whatsoever for whether or not it's a good idea, then you might celebrate the fact that steady, steady reductions, reductions in sea ice are opening new passageways, new passageways and, new and new opportunities for trade. This could potentially slash the time it takes to travel between Asia and the West by as much as 20 days. days. You might even consider that the Arctic, Arctic sea lanes could become could the, 21st before the, century come Suez and the 21st Canals. century Suez and Panama Canals. You would no doubt point out that the Arctic contains 13% of the world's, of the world's undiscovered, oil, undiscovered oil, 30% of, the world's 30 of its undiscovered gas, and an abundance of uranium, rare earth minerals, gold, diamonds, and millions of square miles of untapped resources. And if you are sufficiently psychopathic, you might even suggest that all the countries of the world should have the opportunity to compete for the exploitation of those resources under the global free market system. Thankfully for us though, there's an organization called the Arctic Council that meet once every couple of years to ensure the safe and sustainable stewardship of this fragile region. The latest ministerial meeting took place in May 2019. So this week, I thought I'd take a look at what measures they have put in place to safeguard the future of this precious wilderness. Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. The sharp-eyed and eared among you will have noticed that some of the words I just used were taken directly from a speech by US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo at the opening of the 11th ministerial meeting of the Arctic Council, which took place in Rovaniemi, Finland, on the 7th of May 2019. Pompeo's speech also employed the time on a tactic of a naughty child, which is to point the finger at several other children in the playground and tell teacher that those children have been much, much naughtier than he has, with the hope that attention will be deflected in their direction. The naughty children in question, of course, are Russia and China. As Pompeo was keen to point out, China's nearest point is 900 miles away from the Arctic, so it has no claim whatsoever on Arctic territory. Portland in Maine is actually 1584 miles from the Arctic Circle, but because the US bought Alaska from Russia for about $7 million back in 1857, the US can now legitimately call itself an Arctic state. Oh! Anyway, back to China. They are desperate to secure a stake in the Arctic's future. For several years in the early 2000s, China pleaded with the Arctic Council to grant it what was called observer status and finally in 2013 its wish was granted. Although that doesn't change any of its territorial rights up there, it does mean China gets to attend the ministerial meetings of the council and presumably exert a not inconsiderable backroom influence on proceedings. Back in 2017, China sent an icebreaker called Zhulong or Snow Dragon up into the Arctic carrying a hundred scientists on a mission that was ostensibly aimed at researching the effects of climate change on the region. There are actually three reasons for China's great interest in the area. Climate research is one of them, to be fair, but the other two are exploitation of natural resources and the opening up of trading routes. In fact, the same route taken by the scientific exploration ship is also penciled in as part of China's mind-bogglingly ambitious Belt and Road Initiative. And China knows how to play the long game, of course, unencumbered as they are by anything as inconvenient as a democratic election every five years. So way back in 2004, they established an Arctic research station here in Svalbard. Svalbard is a strategically important and agonizingly beautiful archipelago way up in the Arctic to the east of Greenland and north of Norway, who have territorial control over the islands. China's also got a large embassy in Iceland, 
a country that has enthusiastically welcomed Chinese investment money ever since their catastrophic financial crash back in 2008. Greenland itself has also courted Chinese attention. A country plagued by high unemployment, Greenland sees China's money as a vital injection of capital investment. In 2016, China bought a 12.5% stake in Greenland Minerals and Energy, which gives it access to ever-increasing uranium mining opportunities as the Greenland coastline continues to lose ice as a result of global warming. Arguably, of course, Iceland and Greenland are both nice small soft targets that a mighty operator like China has easily been able to seduce and manipulate. But any conversation about mighty Arctic operators is of course not complete without talking about Russia. Mr Putin has the benefit of more than 24,000 kilometres of coastline around the Arctic Ocean, as well as territorial ownership of waters from the Barents Sea in the west right across to the Bering Sea in the Far East. Russia is absolutely ploughing ahead with plans to extract as much of the newly available Arctic bounty as it can possibly get its hands on. In 2014, it became the world's first producer of Arctic oil. The Paratlamnaya platform on the Russian shelf above the Arctic Circle operates round the clock to extract the black gold. The platform is constantly expanding, putting down new boreholes whenever the geologists find new opportunities. Back in 2018, Putin claimed there was $30 trillion worth of oil beneath his territory. Thankfully, the Russians are not great at oil extraction. According to an article at Bologna.org, to date, the Paratlamnaya has produced only a trickle of poor quality crude. But liquefied natural gas, or LNG, is another matter altogether. Russia's already one of the world's biggest gas producers, and it's got a clear target to become a major player in LNG, with the aim of producing and exporting as much as Qatar in the coming years. Two of Russia's biggest energy companies, Gazprom and Novatek, both already have LNG plants in operation up in the Arctic. And now those companies are also looking to China for partnership and investment, with Novatek selling them a 20% stake in their operations in April 2019. And it's not just China that Russia are courting. This massive and massively cash-strapped country doesn't really care where the money comes from, as long as it comes. France's Total has bought a 10% stake in Novatek's activities, and there's also interest coming from Saudi Aramco, who, let's remind ourselves, recently became the world's most profitable company, posting an eye-watering net income of $111 billion for 2018. So what's the Arctic Council doing in the face of this utter insanity? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the eight Arctic states, that's Russia, USA, Canada, Norway, Finland, Denmark, Sweden and Iceland, all met at the 11th ministerial meeting held in Finland in the first week of May 2019. Here's a couple of snippets from the statement issued by the chairman, Timo Suini, at the end of the conference. A majority of us regard climate change as a fundamental challenge facing the Arctic and acknowledge the urgent need to take mitigation and adaptation actions and to strengthen resilience. Our meeting emphasised the need for national efforts and cooperation on pollution prevention, emission reductions and conservation of biodiversity, while a majority of us particularly emphasise the need to reduce greenhouse gas and black carbon emissions and to enhance work on climate change adaptation. A majority of us noted with concern the IPCC special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius and its findings and emphasised the importance of mitigation and adaptation actions to limit the impacts of climate change on Arctic communities as well as on Arctic cryosphere and ecosystems. So if, as Timo Suimi pointed out several times, the majority agreed to all those things, who on earth was the madman in the room representing the minority that disagreed? Well, yeah, no prizes for guessing. It was our friend good old Mikey Pompeo, of course. For the first time in its history, the Arctic Council was unable to publish a joint declaration on the agreed meeting action points as a direct result of objections from Pompeo's team about the climate change language used. Pompeo and the Trump administration are extremely unhappy about China and Russia's expansion plans in the Arctic, not because of concerns about the environment and climate change, but because they want a bigger piece of the action, and they're scared they may lose some of their global dominance if they don't get involved a bit more aggressively. Let's just remind ourselves of why Pompeo's predecessor, Rex Tillerson, was originally chosen for the role of Secretary of State, 
a man with a lifetime's experience in the oil industry, finishing his career as CEO of Exxon, Rex had zero political or diplomatic experience to qualify him for the new role. He was, however, extremely well placed to broker a prospective $3.2 billion deal between Exxon and the Russian oil giant Rosneft to set up a huge project to search for oil in deep water fields in the Arctic. As I mentioned earlier, Russia haven't proved to be particularly good at this kind of technical exploration, but Exxon have. They're really, really good at it, and Russia needed Exxon's expertise to push the project forward. But US and European sanctions against Russia following their annexation of Crimea had the effect of freezing Exxon's investments in that country, and on the 28th of February 2018, Exxon announced that it had decided to abandon the deal and take an after-tax loss of $200 million. On the 13th of March 2018, less than two weeks later, Tillerson was fired from his position as Secretary of State. Coincidence? I think not! Trump responded to this setback with a typical childlike knee-jerk reaction. In April 2018, he opened up the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge to oil exploration and drilling. This 19 million acre area of Alaskan coast is one of America's most pristine and environmentally sensitive areas, which had been off limits to oil developers since 1980, when Congress designated it as a protected wilderness. But in December 2017, Trump finally got a tax plan through Congress that included a provision allowing drilling in the wildlife refuge areas with plans to formally issue leases to oil and gas companies in 2019. And of course, while all this subterfuge, positioning and finger pointing continues, time and tide and climate change waits for no one. So the Arctic sea ice continues to disappear and our planet continues to warm with ever increasing speed. Just to bring you up to pace with how the Arctic Ocean is looking right now, here's some charts from a good friend of the channel, Patrick McNulty. Regular viewers will know that the charts Patrick provides are taken directly from the declassified archive of the US Navy. You can see that back in May 2012, we still had a large amount of five meter thick ice on the coastlines and even out in the middle of the ocean, there was plenty of ice that was more than three meters thick. By May 2019, most of the coverage is barely more than a metre and a half thick, with still nearly four months to go until the annual minimum in September. This chart from the American National Snow and Ice Data Centre shows how this year's ice extent compares to the 1981 to 2010 medium, which is the grey line, and also to the 2012 record low, which is the black dotted line. To anyone who even gives the slightest damn about the climate and environment, all of this is, of course, deeply disheartening. So I'll just lob in one tiny glimmer of hope in the form of this report from The Independent in April 2019. Norway has historically been a huge beneficiary of the oil resources off its shores, building up a sovereign wealth fund of well over a trillion dollars, which by the way has allowed them to subsidize the cost of Tesla electric cars and exclude them from road toll charges, which is why most people in Norway now drive one. Norway's state oil producer, which used to be called Statoil, but changed its name in 2018 to the much more fluffy and ambiguous Equinor, had nevertheless intended to carry out explorative drilling off the Lofoten Islands in the Arctic. It's reckoned there's between one and three billion barrels of oil there, which Equinor claimed is essential to maintain its production levels. But in a move which has shocked the country's energy industry, the Norwegian parliament has withdrawn its support for the project effectively scuppering it before it starts. And as for that sovereign wealth fund that I mentioned a minute ago, well, according to the Independent article, Norway's government gave the go-ahead on Friday for its $1 trillion or £760 billion oil fund, the world's largest sovereign wealth fund, to invest in renewable energy projects not listed on stock markets. The article goes on to tell us that billions are expected to be spent on wind and solar power projects, it's the latest indication that wealth accumulated through fossil fuels is being redirected towards future projects in renewable energy. Greater numbers of industries and countries have begun fossil fuel divestment strategies, citing future risks to their business and economic models. I've said it before and I'll no doubt say it many times in the future. If your bank, building society, pension fund, insurance company or investment vehicle has any money in any company involved in the fossil fuel industry, 
you can tell them to take your money away from those portfolios and put it into renewable energies instead. It's your money and you get to say what happens to it. History has proven that divestment drives behavioural change in these big companies. They only feel pain in their pockets. So dig out your policies and find out what you're unknowingly funding. That's it for this week. I hope you found the programme informative and useful. If so, please do give us a like and a share. And if you haven't already done so, please also subscribe to the channel to help us get the message to as many people as possible. It's dead easy and free to do that. You just need to click on that link there. As always, thanks very much for watching. Have a great week. And remember to just have a think. See you next week.